My name is Joseph Ford. I'm a lecturer in French studies at the Institute of Modern Languages Research. And um, here at the RMLR, we've spent a little bit of time reflecting on the topic uh, we'll address uh, today and, and for the rest of the week. Um, and I know these discussions have also been going on at the University of Birmingham, uh, where my co-organiser Manuali uh, Santos is based. Uh, so we're really pleased to co-host um, what we think is a really important and vital discussion um, that, that needs to be had in the discipline uh, today and across the rest of, of this week. Um, so just to begin with some thanks. So I wanted to thank all the speakers for making these new online dates. Obviously, we originally organised this conference in person back in, in March at the University of Birmingham. And we, we unfortunately had to cancel that in-person event, but the online does seem to have garnered uh, lots more uh, interest in the conference, which is fantastic to have uh, many more people joining us online and from, from across the world. Um, I wanted to thank uh, participants who couldn't make these rearranged dates, and we are very much hoping to continue the conversation with them in the future. Um, I need to thank the audience uh, for coming along and um, obviously want to encourage you to join in the conversation um, where you, you feel you feel able and um, I'll cover some of the practical issues a little bit later in terms of how B calls will, will work on Zoom and how we'll kind of facilitate the discussion. Um, and final thanks again to Emanuele Santos, who's my brilliant co-organiser at University of Birmingham and um, who's going to join, join the call uh, in a second. Um, oh, and I must also thank Cathy Collins at the RMLR, who's done so much work uh, in organising the kind of administration related to, to this session, um, the sessions this week. So um, decolonising the curriculum um, has obviously been a discussion uh, that's been ongoing for several years now um, and a lot of the demand for decolonizing the curriculum has come from students and we've been in, inspired by conversations going on uh, across uh, universities such as um, Bristol and SOAS um, but we've also noticed that our own discipline um, while it's advanced in these areas in, in research, hasn't necessarily been having as much of a discussion about decolonizing the modern languages curriculum in the classroom. And um, that's really what we're interested in looking at uh, today and over the next few days. Um, and that's why we subtitled our conference, a symposium for sharing uh, practices and ideas. Um, and the aim, um, of the symposium is therefore to explore um, how we might implement a decolonizing practice into the university classroom, how, we're gonna, how, how we can learn from um, people's experiences in this area and the ideas that they have in, in doing that. Um, in the response to our call for papers uh, and more general responses to the program, um, we, you know, it's been really remarkable to see how many people have been interested in these sessions uh, across this week. And we've got over uh, 400 people signed up for the conference over the whole week. And I think they'll drop in and drop out. Um, I can see over 100 on the call uh, already today. Um, but I think that's a really remarkable response and testament to the kind of interest in uh, this topic um, and the necessity for us to, to be engaging. Uh, with this right now. Um, some sessions of the conference are going to be recorded um, and um, uh, that will be for those kind of unable to join can watch back later. Um, we're also planning a uh, publication um, which we'll be working on after the conference and um, one thing uh, we're very keen to stress is that this is the beginning of a conversation that we believe we need to keep having in our discipline. Um, and we're very keen to hear people's ideas uh, about how we engage in that conversation, but also, crucially, how we go about bringing our colleagues uh, from across the discipline into that conversation, um, uh, especially colleagues that perhaps haven't joined the conversation today. Um, I think that's particularly uh, important for us. Um, we do not understand decolonizing as ever completed or finished. Um, at the point that we uh, have a diversification of the curriculum. Um, we don't really see diversity and decolonizing as synonyms. 
but rather uh, we see decolonization as this ongoing process and practice in which uh, we should all uh, be engaged. So um, I'm going to see if Emanuele, would you like to come in? Do you have anything to add to my general comments there before I pass over to practical information about the Zoom session? Uh, no, I would just like uh, to really thank everybody for being here with us. Uh, I am the silent partner because I have a tiny little one, which is four <laughs> months old, and she's not really respecting of um, timetables. I would just like to say a massive thank you to all of you, a massive thank you to all of you to stick to this project, regardless of this exceptional and horrible circumstances in many ways. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your undying commitment with this initiative that, you know, we know that reflects your practices in an everyday life and is absolutely inspiring. Um, and I would like to thank Joe very much because uh, I, I got a baby uh, in May and since then he has, of course, communicated with all of you and then the, the most part of the organization of the practical methods since uh, the event could not take place in Birmingham. And I would really, really like to thank him here. Uh, because uh, being a new mom, it's, it's, it's a bit tough. Uh, I will be um, uh, introducing a few of you and some of the sessions, and I'll be part of the Kikere. I mean, I'm here. I'm just a bit uh, in the background. Thank you very much. And Joe, you can take on. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. That's great. And um, I just want to pass over to some practical uh, uh, questions now before we move to the, uh, the first session. Uh, at 10.30. So um, just to remind you all, I did uh, say this in the email um, and you, you would have received a Zoom link which will work for all sessions throughout the whole week. So you need to just keep keep your hands on that Zoom link and click on each day and you should be able to join any session uh, that you'd like throughout, throughout the rest of the week. Um, if speakers could please join five minutes before they're due to their panels due to spot, uh, start, we'll just make sure that all the tech is working, that you're able to share your screen. Um, we will open the chat on uh, for Q&A uh, just before the end of the session. I'm aware there's quite a lot of people on the call and so I think having the chat open during the talks is going to make a difficult job for me sifting through all the questions. So we'll open it just before the Q&A at the end. The chat can be anonymous if you would like it to be, um, but could you please direct your anonymous questions to me rather than to everyone, otherwise um, it will not be anonymous. And um, if you would like to come on camera and ask your question, that is absolutely fine. And we would encourage that. Um, but let us know in the chat or raise your digital hand and we'll let you, um, we'll, we'll let you come on or we can unmute you and let you come on camera to ask your question. Um, in terms of the digital hand, you'll find that at the bottom of your screen, if you click on participants, which is on the bottom of the screen, you'll find a, a button uh, uh, to, uh, I think, to the right hand side called raise hand. So that's how you raise your digital hand. Um, you'll see the program tomorrow. Uh, we'll start uh, at the later time of 11 a.m. Um, and then on Thursday, we'll be back to 10.30 start. And then on Friday, the session is afternoon only from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, and I think that's all from me. Um, obviously, really uh, thanks to the speakers and really looking forward to what is a really exciting program. And if there are any questions that you have for me, you can direct them to me in the chat via Zoom or you uh, uh, can send me an email uh, failing if the chat doesn't work. Okay, so um, I think that's it. Um, and I'm going to pass straight over to Amar, who I think is online. Um, Amar uh, Genduzi is a professor of literature in the Department of English uh, and Faculty of Le uh, Letters uh, and uh, Languages at Mouloud uh, Mameri uh, University in Tizi Ouzou in Algeria. Your title today, Amar, is um, Decolonizing Algerian and Algerian Course in English Literature. So I'll pass over to you. That's thank, it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, John. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to join you in this conference. So I, I started by thanking you, John, for 
making this conference possible and for accepting my proposal. And I said that this is a very engaging topic with many, many disciplinary ramifications. I will speak about the uh, literature, English literature syllabus in Algeria by, by discussing four aspects, which are curriculum, syllabus, teacher's practice, and textbooks. I start the presentation by my students' perceptions of Africa, perceptions which make it very urgent to engage the, to the topic of decolonizing the English literature syllabus. Indeed, each time I meet my students for the first MA class in African literature, I always ask them to uh, I ask them about sub-Saharan African countries in order to assess their needs on the subjects. As you can read on the slide, some of their answers are disheartening. Most students think that there were no states, no governments in pre-colonial Africa. For them, pre-colonial Africans lived in, quote, the jungle or mysterious and exotic forests. For my students, my students have very little knowledge of slavery and the horrors of the slave trade. For a few, for a few of them, slavery was, quote, natural because the West, quote, is civilized, whereas the blacks lived in, quote, darkness. For my students, for most of my students, pre-colonial Africans spoke only one language and had, quote, a primitive culture. These misrepresentations are not just historically wrong, they are also dangerous, hopefully. They are altogether amended at the end of the African literature class. However, the inappropriate teaching of English literature might, might be responsible in the students' misrepresentations. It is true that the students' knowledge of African past and geography is very poor, but the vocabulary they use, such as savage, darkness, primitive, is found in the English fiction they are exposed to. Hence, the urgent need to decolonize the subject of English literature. So this presentation intends to address this need by reading critically the curriculum of the BA course in English, raising issues about the English literature syllabus, discussing the literature teacher's practice, and demonstrating the need for new classroom materials. In engaging those issues, I hope to give a new shape to the decolonized syllabus and to underpin it within a new frame, framework. To reach the, uh, these objectives, two main concepts will be invoked here. These are the hidden curriculum or, or already introduced by Elizabeth and which refers to implicit and unacknowledged orientation of the curriculum. Two, decolonization. This is in the conce a concept in the formation and I want to appropriate it from my Algerian context and for the needs of my students. This presentation, I hope, will conclude by a tentative definition of what I mean by decolonizing English literature from the perspective of my perspective here in Algeria. I begin by reminding that English was not colonial language in Algeria. It is taught at the middle and high schools as a language class aimed at fostering cultural and communication skills only. The middle and high, schools teach, uh, high school teachers of English hold the university degree, a BA or MA. Their higher education is addressed in this presentation through the study of the literature subject of the BA course. I start by describing the BA curriculum, its objectives and the place of literature in it. In Algerian universities, the BA degree in English is called the Licence in English Language. The word language spelled in the course name is pleonastic since licence in English could have sophist. However, the pleonasm is intended. As such, it calls for some comments. This course name is misleading because it might indicate that the course subject is solely language skills, such as grammar, phon phonetics, etc., and is not discipline knowledge, such as BA, 
a BA in English literature or a BA in English history. This claim is only partially true. The language classes are indeed part of the course, an important part of the course. However, they are taught alongside other disciplinary subjects such as literature, linguistics, and history, which from semester one to semester six increasingly gain in credit number, while the opposite is the case for the language classes. The pleonastic title of the BA is also significant because, supposedly, the focus of the curriculum is put away from the culture and history of the language. Obviously, this claim is irrelevant because any language has a history or histories and conveys a culture. In the case of English, history shows that it was also an instrument of domination and that ideology shaped and inflected its use. Now I move to the description and discussion of the syllabus, of the literature syllabus. This, the slide shows the literature class names and time distribution. I retain two class names. These are found on semester two to semester four. It is literatures of English. So, and the second class name is for, in semester five and six, study of English literary texts. The objectives of this class, of these classes, is to support the language classes, introduce the culture of English, and define the culture or cultures of English, and define and apply literary concepts. This syllabus description raises a number of issues. What are the literatures of English? Can they be covered within the limited class time? How to select literary texts? Following what criteria? How to teach them? The syllabus designers have not specified the literatures of English. This is an interesting point because it, the door is left open for literatures other than the ones of England and the US to be included in the syllabus. However, the syllabus gives no orientation as to the choice of literary texts, nor on the way they should be taught. Why? In fact, here lies the crux of the matter, because of the lack of orientation is not fortuitous, not, nor without serious consequences. Does the absence of orientation reflect the designer's lack of awareness of the imperial thrust and the ethnic bias of a large segment of English literature? Or is it just the opposite, i.e. the designers were fully aware of the issue under, underlying the teaching of English literature and couldn't solve, but couldn't solve it? In either cases, the absence of orientation as to the choice of literary text is problematic. It may arise out of the vague and blurred definition of what we mean today by English literature or literatures in English. For if the English language has an ancestral homeland, literatures in English are found now in all continents. This leads me to the investigation of the literature subject contents. How do teachers flesh out the syllabus given that it is vague and ambiguous? In most Algerian departments of English, literatures of English is understood solely as, quote, mainstream English and American literatures. A few departments, including the teachings, literatures from other countries or minority UK and US literatures. The teaching is organized chronologically from the early modern period to the postmodern one. The classes are also articulated around literary movements or periods such as literature of reason, romanticism, realism and naturalism and modernist literature. When an author is selected, he or she is th thought to be, quote, well known and his work, quote, distinguished. The analysis uh, uh, the literary works or literary text analysis is uninformed by critical theory, dealing solely with plot, characters, setting, themes, and diction. The, the authors who figure most prominently in the program are Shakespeare, Defoe, Wordsworth, Conrad, and Joyce. Interviews conducted with teachers have shown that they teach following a historical approach because simply it is, quote, convenient. They claim that they were taught the same stuff and in the same way. It is this stuff, they add, that is found in the library resources. Most of the young teachers would probably not know, but their approach to the subject of literatures in English is informed by liberal humanist approach. Though dated, this practice of literature teaching 
survives in our departments through textbooks and ontologies, which make it very convenient to teach literature through chronology and by singling out, quote, outstanding and essential authors. This brings me to the exploration of some English literature textbooks to understand how colonial discourse operates through the liberal humanist approach. For this, I have selected and examined three books whose contents are in line with my colleagues' practice. The publishing details of the three books are mentioned on the slide. The first book is American, published in colonial time. The second is English, published in colonial time and republished after decolonization. The third one is a French book published long after decolonization. In spite of the time span and the geographical location separating the publications of these books, they are all informed by the liberal humanist approach, which structures their pedagogical contents and confers unity to their subject. Critics have already unveiled the values, attitudes, and assumption of this approach, which also nurtures in learners the kind of thoughtless perceptions held by my students on Africa and Africans. For this reason, I will not restate them here. I will rather expand on the following questions with regard to English literary history. What do the textbooks say about English cross-cultural encounters since early 17th century? Do they establish any link between English language and literature on the one hand and empire on the other? How do they introduce major colonial authors, namely Defoe, Kipling, and Conrad, and their colonial texts? The exploration of their textbooks reveals, I'm afraid, that colonial history and politics are altogether, are almost grossed over by the authors. All developments in English literature are presented as endogenous to England, to England, its government, intellectual elite, and society. As if the first English cultural encounters with Africa did not occur until the end of the 19th century, and as if imperialism did not enter English politics and literature until Conrad and Kipling. Though English liter literary history is divided into different periods or movements, there is in the textbooks no period called, for example, the literature of empire or colonial literature. The criteria for the inclusion or exclusion of a writer are not stated clearly by the authors of the textbooks. Add to this, Anglophone literary voices from the empire are all together absent, as if no, literary, na no native literary voice emerged from the colonies for centuries. Finally, colonial authors such as Defoe, Conrad, and Kipling are all given a political readings. The case of Kipling, the bard of empire, as he is called, is indicative of the kind of selective criticism practiced by liberal humanist critics. Grebani praises the uh, Kipling's jungle books and considers them very uh, beautiful and imaginative. And he also extols his short stories as being, quote, very real and very romantic at the same time. Burgess, on his part, describes Kipling as, quote, a poet who knows the East and who wrote, quote, excellent and refreshing short stories. Finally, in spite of all this praise, Vrely and Valentin, and Valentin say very little on Kipling. They mention a brief biosketch of two lines and, the, and insert his infamous poem, The White Man's Burden. The treatments of the different treatments of colonial authors in the textbooks demonstrate that the ideology of English literary history veers always between two extreme strategies. These are aesthetic and a, politic, a political celebration or concealment. Though they seem different, the two strategies are meant to fulfill one aim, to gloss over, skip, or repress the, ampl the unpleasant nature of colonial domination and the author's contribution, the, the studied author's contribution in propagating the ideals of imperialism. Therefore, any attempt to decolonize the curriculum, therefore, any attempt to decolonize the literature syllabus has to be concerned with bringing to the light of history first and then to critical analysis second of what was rendered invisible by ideology. This includes, first, colonial 
the colonial ethics, policies, practices, laws, etc., which shaped colonial authors' consciousness. Second, colonial strategies of domination, domination in, including the manipulation of language. Third, colonial texts, it will bring colonial texts with ethnic or race bias, or those which circulated, validated, or strengthened colonial discourse. These texts should be submitted to political and historical readings and engage with the means of contemporary theory and the instrument, instruments of critical discourse analysis. In addition to uh, embedding English literature within imperial history, what, in, a, in a kind what, uh, of what Edward Said calls contrapuntal reading, the decolonized literature, literature syllabus should also unearth native voices who spoke for their people, culture, and history. These broad orientations should be underpinned in a new interdisciplinary paradigm, which spans several sciences, such as political science, social sciences, and humanities as a whole. I, I think I'm reminding here, I'm reminded of what just uh, Elizabeth said previously. In literary studies, the new paradigm revokes the traditional literary history and every exclusive or ethnocentric thought. In the new paradigm, the non-Western order would be acknowledged for having made possible the articulation of the West self, Western self. As for the cross-cultural encounters between Europe and Africa, they would, they would be reread as the formative experience of Western modernity. With the, this new paradigm, Caliban's curses and Friday's silence are not absence of language, are not absence of speech, which bears witness to the birth of an interconnected world where nations, languages, and cultures enjoy mutual recognition and where other futures of more justice. You had just mentioned okay, Edward, but, Edward Said. Yes. Okay, Thank yeah, you. yeah. As I said, in, um, in addition to embedding English literature within imperial history, what Edward Said calls uh, counterpartal reading, the decolonized literature syllabus should also unearth native voices who spoke for their people, their culture, and their history. Do you hear me, John? I, I, yes. I can't hear you. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay. The, the decolonized sh sh syllabus should be underpinned in a new inter interdisciplinary paradigm, which spans several sciences, such as political sciences, social sciences, and the humanities as a whole. In literary studies, the new paradigm revokes the traditional literary history and every exclusive and ethnocentric thought. In the new paradigm, the non-Western order would be acknowledged for having made possible the articulation of the modern Western self. As for the cross-cultural encounters between Europe and Africa, they would be reread as a formative experience of Western modernity. Within this new paradigm, Caliban's curses and Friday's silence are not absence of language, but fully human ontological and ontological presence which bears witness to the birth of an interconnected world where nations, languages, and cultures enjoy mutual recognition and where other futures of more justice, more humanity, and more exchange are possible. Is that all right? Wonderful. Per perfect. Thank you, Omar. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for your presentation and, and for that perspective on, on Algeria, which uh, gives us uh, some food for thought, I think in terms of um, how, how we conceive of the problem here. Um, so um, thank you all, thank you all for, for brilliant presentations. Um, thank you for joining us again um, after this morning's uh, session. And we are um, in this session um, looking at, I mean, we've entitled the second panel uh, From Language Canons to a Decolonized Literary and Theoretical Commons. And we've actually got three speakers. Um, Inbe uh, will not make it today, but we may well be able to catch up with him later in the week. Um, so uh, we've got three papers, including uh, my own and, and Manuale's. 
um, which is a, a co-written paper, but which I'll deliver. Um, we've got uh, Manis, uh, Melisandre uh, Varin, and uh, we've got Ruth Bush. Now, Ruth's talk, which I'm about to share with you, is a pre-recorded talk because uh, Ruth was unfortunately not able to join us in person today, but she has been kind enough to pre-record pre a talk, which I'll play back over, over the platform in a second. Um, uh, Ruth, I'll try, try and introduce Ruth and share the talk at the same time, but bear with me uh, as I try and work out the uh, technicalities of sharing my screen. Um, there we go. So um, I'm hoping now you can all see and hopefully hear um, Ruth. Um, and I'm just gonna introduce Ruth before I bless, press play. So Ruth is, uh, as I say, unable to join us in person today, but she's very keen to uh, watch back the Q&A at the end of this session and to engage with anyone who would like to ask questions of her talk um, uh, afterwards. Um, and um, as you'll see, Ruth's very keen to uh, for this to be the beginning of a conversation um, as as we are uh, too. So Ruth is Senior Lecturer in French and Comparative Literature at the University of Bristol. Um, she is also Programme Director for the MA in Black Humanities at the University of Bristol. And Ruth was initially a keynote speaker for our conference, um, but we decided in the end that um, we would rather have a discussion um, as peers here, we would rather not unnecessarily introduce hierarchy into the equation. So we've gone down the route of um, not having any keynote speakers in, in, the, in, in the symposium. And we hope that that will um, help in many ways to facilitate um, a kind of honest uh, and um, engaged conversation between us all without hierarchies. So Ruth is gonna talk for about 25 minutes. Um, then we'll move on and I'll pass over to Manuale, who's going to uh, present myself and herself. And then um, finally, um, Melisandre uh, Barr. So um, I'll press play and hope that you can hear Ruth. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you first to um, Joan and Manuel for keeping the momentum going um, with this event over um, recent months and thank you also for allowing me to give this paper um, in this format and I'm really sorry that I'm not with you live as I'm on annual leave. Um, I'm looking forward to listening back to um, the discussion and hope continuing these conversations. So this is a condensed version of the keynote that I was due to give um, at the original version of the symposium um, and in which I reflect at greater length on the idea of um, the commons and working towards a decolonial kind of commons um, and I'm building um, that in relation to my current um, short monograph project on histories of literary translation and retranslation in Senegal and Cameroon um, and the concept um, I'm building in particular from work by Ellen Ostrom, Fred Moten and Stefano Harney, Antonio Hart and Michael Negri. And basically that idea the commons is about um, resources, it's about common resources um, and how they are governed, how they are distributed. Um, and so in terms of resources we're thinking about multilingualism and language as a resource um, the literary imagination as a resource, um, a resource for self and collective um, imaginative expression, but which is also really fraught um, and subject to ideological and political pressures. Um, so there's also a, a material dimension to the project in thinking through how um, resources such as funding for education, um, mentorship, publishing, um, distribution, access to digital technology shape um, histories of translation in particular, um, retranslation. Um, in terms of um, this particular symposium though, I want to make a broader argument and the broader argument is about the need to return critically to the history of the discipline of modern languages um, and that return then informing um, a future idea of a literary and linguistics commons. Um, 
And I found um, helpful, um, as I'm sure many of you have, um, the um, manifesto which is included um, in Alison Phipps' book, Decolonising Multilingualism, and particularly this argument. The mess we have made of people's land, languages, of rivers and of the air is no respecter of nationally drawn post-colonial boundaries. And any decolonizing foreign language pedagogy worth its salt will need to remember the intimate connections between land, language, and its need of the air for speech, any speech, anywhere to find articulation. So it's that need of the air um, in particular for speech in any language, um, which really resonates in our current moment of ecological crisis, as well as the racial and social inequalities highlighted by the death of George Floyd um, and the ensuing Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and so I'm going to unpack a bit further um, and try to begin to historicize um, these current calls for a decolonial approach. Um, in June of this year, Edward Colston's statue was um, magnificently ripped from its pedestal in Bristol and took what the city poet Vanessa Kisule described as a syncopated splash into the city's harbour. Um, and the ongoing effects of this have been um, to amplify um, longer running and grassroots calls for um, changes within the city and within the institution of um, the University of Bristol. Um, and I'm thinking here of um, the appointment of Professor Olivet Otele, who's investigating the university's historical links to transatlantic slavery. Um, also, um, the work that I've been closely involved in around the um, MA Black Humanities um, and the Associated Centre for Black Humanities. Um, and the kind of now strong bottom-up and top-down work on scholarship schemes, renaming of buildings, um, the deeper reflection on the form of the curriculum, uh, redesigning the university's crest. Um, our university's crest includes Colston's um, dolphin, for example. Um, and this builds on um, work, student-led um, work, um, such as the Why Is My Curriculum White campaign um, and this um, petition to rename one of our prominent university buildings, the Wills Memorial Building, um, Henry Wills, the university founder, um, having made his wealth through the tobacco trade. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge at this point that there are much earlier antecedents of um, pressure to um, decolonise and challenge, challenge mainstream education, particularly schools education, I'm thinking here of the Black Supplementary Schools movement of the 1960s and 1970s um, and Bernard Cord's book, How the West Indian Child is Made Educationally Subnormal in the British School System, um, is a kind of iconic publication about that particular movement. Um, in higher education, um, discussions around decoloniality, I think, um, I'm talking particularly from my own experience here and, you know, I'm I wish I was there to engage in the conversation and to hear, to hear um, directly from you about your own experiences. Um, but these conversations expose um, very personal and individual kinds of vulnerability, I think. Um, and also those kind of blind spots in and um, dead ends, if you like, or um, impasse in how we conceptualise and think about um, academic disciplines. Um, and I think there are, in my own area of literary studies, there has been some um, quite extensive reflection on the connections between um, coloniality and the discipline of literary studies, particularly English literary studies. Um, I'm thinking here of the, um, of Gauri Viswanathan's uh, Marks of Conquest, um, of course, much earlier texts um, such as um, Ngugiwationgo's um, kind of manifesto on the abolition of the English department, um, and then much more recently, um, Bhakti Sringapur's Cold War Assemblages, Decolon Decolonization to Digital. 
Um, and this work shows how ideological and political agendas um, inform and distort contexts of cultural production from publishing houses and small magazines through to schools and universities. And Shrinkapur talks particularly about the CIA funding of literary journals, um, the funding of area studies departments um, during the period of the, the early period of the Cold War, um, and this um, scholar to spy pipeline, which was found within Ivy League universities um, from the 1950s through to the 1970s. Um, come, to come to the UK context, um, Nicola McClellan's work on the history of language education um, has, 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 and the kind of bigger project around her, her research um, is a brilliant way into thinking about the very complex contemporary realities of modern languages education in this country. Um, modern languages, as it exists in the UK and Ireland, has historically been an elitist and Eurocentric discipline. And I think there's still um, quite a lot of work to be done on the connections between 19th century settler colonialism, imperial expansion um, and decline, Britain's own Cold War politics and intelligence services, and how these things connect to um, the history of language learning. If we think about modern languages departments emerging in the 18th century um, in response to the dominance of Latin, um, and then th thinking about how they are set up in national silos and, and historically privileged, standardized, metropolitan, Western European um, languages, um, we obviously turn our minds to the really important work undertaken by the AHRC's Translating Cultures Strand, um, and the associated transnationalizing modern languages um, program of program of work, which is really um, challenged um, in quite comprehensive ways, methodological nationalism within modern languages. Um, coming back to the history, um, it's interesting to note that Asian and Middle Eastern languages started much earlier than the 18th century at Oxford and at the Collège de France in, in Paris. Um, but the learning of other non-European languages in the UK really only expanded with the political and economic imperatives of the British Empire. Um, we then have this key moment in the wake of World War I, um, when modern languages becomes reinvigorated by, by a peace-building agenda. Um, and that peace-building agenda brought substantial funding. And, um, here I'm thinking um, of um, the funding by Basil Zaharoff at the University of Oxford. Um, Basil Zaharoff, who as you can see here, is a, a kind of cartoon, cartoonish um, epitome of um, an evil arms dealer. Um, and I mentioned Zaharoff um, because he funded my own doctoral studies. So this is something that I, you know, I kind of grapple with on, on an ongoing basis. Um, he also funds the prestigious uh, Marshall Foch chair in French at All Souls College. Um, another key um, document of associated with modern languages in this post-war moment um, is the government's lease report um, on the position of modern languages in the education system of Great Britain, which was published in April 1918. And a few people have written on this, Susan Bailey, um, Di Holmes has, has a, a chapter in it, on it in the French studies in and for the 21st century volume. Um, this document sets out the perceived ignorance of British people concerning foreign countries and their peoples, and it proposes a really significant investment in modern languages. And it talks about the, assess the content of the syllabus, um, weighing up um, practical ends and the kind of pursuit of a refined aesthetic sensibility. And you can see this in the two quotations I've put up here. We owe no apology for putting practical ends first. Um, and then the second quote, train, it's encouraging training, which tends to develop the higher faculties. Um, note later in that, in that quotation, um, it cannot bring them to all. In their full, fullness, they can be possessed by a few, um, but in some measure, they may be shared by all who desire them. Um, so there's a kind of echo here of that 19th century Arnoldian defense of higher education, of high culture. Um, 
It's interesting that the document, the report, argues um, for French as by far the most important language in the history of modern civilization. And, you know, anyone with um, even a kind of um, brief um, engagement with post-colonial theory will recognize immediately the unspoken implication of that statement. That, that, you know, where there is an idea of civilization, there is also the idea of what is not or less civilized. Um, and that colonial binary which underpins the physical and epistemic violence of directly contemporary French civilizing mission, British indirect rule, Germany's occupation of present day Cameroon, Namibia and Togo, Italy's invasion of Abyssinia, Belgium's exploitation of the Congo and the Portuguese colonial project in Angola, Mozambique, in Guinea-Bissau. Um, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the um, institutional barriers and methodological challenges um, which I think continue um, to, to pose obstacles um, in, in some universities. And again, this is a kind of provocation and I'd like to continue this discussion in relation to other people's um, experience of their own departments. Um, to, there are kind of three main ones. The first one is um, the integration of non-metropolitan European languages into our teaching. The second is how we connect with English studies. And the third is the tension between literature um, or cultural studies and language studies um, within the discipline. Um, and thinking here, um, the first one from the 1970s onwards, and McClellan talks a bit about this in her book, um, there's a shift in ethos uh, very gradually towards including non-European languages, um, Urdu, Arabic, Punjabi, Yoruba, for example, in the school education system. Um, 88 um, UK national curriculum in the government's 2002 national languages strategy. Um, but as Rachel Gilmore reminds us in her um, a brilliant recent book called Bad English, um, these languages were integrated as modern foreign languages um, rather than as part of a broader literary and historical syllabus. Um, so they're not kind of intimately connected to um, students' use of English in their everyday lives. Um, something which can lead to kind of different kinds of empowerment. Um, they're often referred to as community or heritage languages and have continued to be taught mostly outside of mainstream education, again in supplementary schools. Um, in Bristol was a, was a very active Somali Saturday school, for example. Um, if you don't um, know it already, then um, please have a look at the Multilingual Manchester Project, um, which, is engaged, which has been for years engaging with these questions as they relate to to Manchester's um, linguistic diversity. I think as teachers of language and their associated cultures, we really have a responsibility to reveal the mechanisms that shape dominant forms of language and culture, including within Great Britain. Um, and I think um, I'm leaning here on Moton and Harney's suggestion that universities, even under a neoliberal economic regime, can create space and time for non-normative thought and for refusing what they call the dominant call to order. Um, so there's kind of a continued need for, for work to address the bias towards Western European languages um, within our sector. Um, historically then, thinking about the language um, and literature and culture studies connection. Um, here I found um, Donaldo Macedo's um, work quite helpful. Donaldo Macedo is an applied linguistic specialist um, working in the States and someone who worked really closely with um, the rad radical education theorist, um, the Brazilian Paulo Freire. Um, and he highlights these hierarchies as they've, um, as they've manifested in the States. Um, and he, he writes um, here, um, foreign literature departments have traditionally relegated foreign language teaching to a subdisciplinary low status in the academy. Uh, most literature professors, who are also mostly middle class and white, make decisions about the curriculum while knowing very little about the complex nature of the foreign language they teach. They know, and this is key, they know even less about the multitude of language varieties that surround their university, particularly in urban centres. And then in, in the second quote here, he talks about um, the need to shift um, the pedagogy to move towards this radical language pedagogy that respects and celebrates the language practices that students bring to school and makes concrete values such as solidarity, 
social responsibility and creativity. So I think this also relates to um, not only the question of what universities are for, so the kind of value of universities and modern languages in society, but that related question of who universities are for. Um, and um, Tom Sperlinger, Richard Pettigrew and Josie McClellan have written a book called Who Are Universities For, which I um, highly recommend. Um, and particularly, um, I'm thinking here about the need to renew continuing education, adult education and extramural work, um, which historically was once a core aspect um, of um, the syllabus of civic universities, such as Bristol or my former place of work, the University of Westminster. Um, to bring this um, talk to, to a close, um, I, I want to end by kind of briefly a brief example from my current teaching and research. Um, my research in recent years has been in two areas, um, contemporary literary activism in sub-Saharan Africa, um, particularly as it relates to literary translation and building um, a co-produced project with non-academic partners um, and colleagues based in Global South institutions. Um, and then um, my um, ongoing um, longer term project, which is around um, African university campus cultures. Um, and I'm going to end with an example um, about a project that I've been um, involved in with my colleague, um, Professor Madhu Krishnan and the Bakwa Multimedia Collective, who are based in Yaoundé in Cameroon. Um, this is part of an AHRC funded follow on project on creative writing and translation for peace. Um, it aims to address the particularly fraught language politics in Cameroon. Cameroon is an officially bilingual country where there has been a long running conflict between the Francophone majority and an Anglophone separatist movement in the north and southwest regions of the country. And these, this has been exacerbated in armed conflict since 2016. Um, and one element of this project was a week long um, literary translation training workshop. Um, here are some faces from the workshop. Um, this involved practical exercises, working on different literary genres, um, networking with local publishers, and theoretical reflection through the reading group sessions. Um, which closed um, each day with a lively debate on different themes such as um, machine translation, translating into and from African languages, poetry translation, um, and so on. And, and these, the workshop was led um, by um, Edvige Traw, who is an Ivorian um, writer and translator and literary activist, um, Ross Schwartz, who is a British-based um, literary translator, and Dr Georgina Collins. Um, who is another um, academic and British-based um, literary translator. Um, and an anthology is going to be published shortly coming out of these workshops. Um, I want to talk about one very brief example of a text that was translated by students, um, participants in the workshop, um, which is an extract chosen by Ed Vige um, Hall, um, an extract from Jane Austen's Emma, um, and stu um, students were invited to translate this into um, Cam Franglais or into Pigeon English. And these are both um, widely spoken in Cameroon, in particular Pigeon, which has um, a, a standardised orthography and enables communication with the neighbouring economic powerhouse, um, Nigeria. Um, and here is an extract um, by uh, Ray and Debbie, who um, hopefully you can see that. Um, it's, I'll read it, I'm not sure that you can see the, the first line. Um, it's the first, it's the opening of that novel. Um, I'll, I'll just read the Camp Franglais. Uh, um, so he, he translates it as Mon frère, Emma Woodhouse est une mot wise au school et très porteuse. Elle vivait dans la, vie, la mort de la ville à man. C'est comme si nous en étions seulement qu'aime l'accompagner. Massa. 21 ans déjà qu'elle life sans stress. Elle et sa big étaient les seuls munins d'un pâteur genre trop pisse. Depuis qu'ils sont restés ses marides, c'est elle qui a begin à gérer et les ouais du, du vieux, même si elle était encore bindi. Um, I'm sorry, I can't figure out how to play the recording of Ray um, reading this at the workshop. Um, it was during a rainstorm and the quality is um, not great. 
Um, but in terms of using this in the classroom, I think the translation could be the basis for a discussion of contact languages, um, thinking about um, cam franglais itself as, as a language, as a language um, which, as the discussions um, in the workshop after um, Ray read his translation revealed, um, is really important for thinking about how these um, young writers and translators are negotiating the language politics um, in Cameroon. Um, we could think about it in terms of the theorization of world literature, which is that which gains in translation or which retains inherent untranslatability. Um, or, or for another close reading of Austen's deft prose and witty characterization, perhaps via Said's celebrated post-colonial critique of the racial politics of Mansfield Park. Um, above all though, and I think when using it in teaching, I invite students to explore the contemporary literary scene from which this translation speaks using digital tools such as Instagram, which has been the um, preferred platform for um, African literature festivals um, during the COVID pandemic. There have been um, several editions of the Afrolit Sans Frontières um, Festival, as well as the Back Backwards Own um, Literary Festival, Backward Lit Fest. Um, I'd also encourage students to discuss their own use of uh, non-standard English and to think about how and when and whether they encounter that in literary texts that they've read, particularly texts they might have read at school. Um, and um, lastly, I think I'd really emphasise the common experience of participating in this workshop um, and the kinds of um, feedback um, that participants um, provided um, about the importance of sharing these spaces, sharing the conversations, um, sharing um, climatic conditions, um, and how these frames that particular multilingual moment of Ray's translation um, in ways that are only partly captured in the recording. Um, so I think whilst the structural inequalities and their associated violences lie at the heart of the decolonial project, um, that as, as teachers and as researchers, um, that we can still um, attune ourselves to that ethics of of care and of joy and of empowerment um, that can still be traced through translation and multilingual creative practice and which I think are still central to the future of an education in languages. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry I've gone slightly over time. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ruth, of course, for, for recording this paper and sharing this with us. Uh, we're gonna have the opportunity to discuss her paper uh, towards the the end of the panel. Um, now, moving on, our next speaker, uh, Mbaye Bashir Lowe from Duke University, has had uh, uh, unforeseen circumstances. So they might be joining us a little bit later on uh, in the conference. Uh, what's going to happen now is that uh, Joe, uh, Joseph Ford, is going to be reading uh, the paper authored by him and me. Uh, and I would just like to introduce Joe a little bit more formally even though he's been in contact with all of us. Um, jo, uh, Joseph Ford uh, is a lecturer in French studies at the Institute for Modern Languages Research. His research focuses on contemporary French and Francophone literatures and culture, with special interest in Algeria and what has, be, uh, has become to known as the Algerian Civil War or the Black Decade of the 1990s. His wider research interests are in postcolonial criticism or literature, literary translation and migration. And he has previously taught at Durham University, uh, at the University of Leeds and uh, University of Paris at Créteil. Now, when it comes to me, my name is Emmanuel Alessandros. I'm a lecturer in uh, modern languages at the University of Birmingham, where I also coordinate the Portuguese studies program. My research focuses on the intersections between the cultures of the Portuguese speaking world, postcolonial studies, theories of world literature, and they draw attention into the local systemic dialectics of epistemology uh, and also uh, literary critical theory. Uh, my work also addresses representations of race, gender and sexuality, memory uh, studies, world systems theory, and decolonial critique, especially with regards with structures of inequality, oppression, and hegemony. Now, uh, the paper that uh, Joe will be reading for us today is titled Deconstruct to Decolonize Towards a Decolonial Practice. Joe, please. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Manuali, and uh, thank you all for joining. Um, so as Manuali was saying, this is a paper that we co-authored, but which I'll read uh, in its integrity, and then we'll come back together for the Q&A, to the Q&A at the end. So um, decolonizing as it's used today, as we've been seeing, is a concept with myriad definitions, um, all of which uh, depend on the kind of geographical, material, ideological locus of enunciation of the speaker. Um, in decolonizing the university, I should remember to share my slides as well. Excuse me, I'm just going to locate them. Bear with me two seconds. Okay, so I assume you can all see that. Um, so this is Decolonizing the University by um, uh, Gaminda Bambra um, and others. Um, so they say that first, it is a way of thinking about the, this is uh, decolonizing, that they're, pro they're proposing a definition of. First, it's a way of thinking about the world which takes colonialism, empire and racism as its empirical and discursive objects of study. It resituates these phenomena as key shaping forces of the contemporary world in a context where their role has been systematically effaced from view. Uh, second, it purports to offer alternative ways of thinking about the world and alternative forms of political praxis. And we take these two um, starting points uh, uh, as our kind of point of departure. Um, so when we think of decolonizing the modern languages curriculum in the UK, we believe that curricula too should expose, analyze and help our students understand the relationship with the capitalist world system um, of which colonialism is a phase um, to forms of exclusion and exploitation in the present day. Um, we also understand that this way of thinking is the basis from which to reconfigure what we choose to teach and by virtue of the societal roles of universities in this country to brand as knowledge for our students. And this is an aim that offers specific challenges, we think, uh, to the field of modern languages. Um, literature on the establishment, and Ruth, uh, Ruth Bush spoke about this in her paper, on the establishment of modern languages as a degree in UK universities documents a history of, uh, of hostility, of snobbery, of privilege, and of disregard for language teaching, um, considered as a lesser subject compared to, to classics and the teaching of, of Latin, um, modern languages was so looked down upon um, that it took Oxford 180 years to approve it as a discipline, uh, which finally happened in 1903. Um, for the late 19th and early 20th century detractors of the discipline, the commitment to uh, living languages was not enough to elevate it to a serious uh, subject. And in fact, the very establishment of the degree happens at a time when universities are being opened up to women, um, themselves inferior to men in British society. So the, the change, um, however, uh, came, uh, uh, finally came off the back of what Posner identifies as the empire's uh, need for practical linguistics in colonial administration and trade, as well as the growing demand for qualified teachers in schools. Yet despite these uh, practical aims, the discipline took its shape from no other than its foe, uh, classics, and started very much as rooted in the study of canonical and relatively old literary texts in the target language, um, but taught through the medium of English, um, with the communicative aspect of languages uh, being deemed unessential. And this is an aspect that, as we can, we can, we can probably all see, still shapes and the hierarchies of departments and modern languages today. Modern languages thus found its way into UK academia by wrestling with and taking over from um, what you might think of as a civilizational fetish of classics. Um, it was implemented thanks to the conservative need for colonial uh, civil servants and the liberal argument for trade um, with other um, Western colonial powers. And from its inception, the kinds of canonical literature studied was often itself committed to that same Eurocentric project as classics. 
Meanwhile, uh, little regard was given to languages' oral and aural competencies, which we can still see today in the lack of prestige conferred to the professionals involved in the teaching of these skills compared to, uh, say, their colleagues on the often literary-based or research track or professorial track. And further to that, a combination of uninspiring uh, literature-led language curricula at school level um, combined with the government actively discouraging language learning in a cultural movement that ended up in, in Brexit, uh, created a situation in which modern languages are more likely to be picked up by A-level students uh, who, who, are, who are more wealthy. Manuela was talking about that a little bit in our question uh, this morning. According to Coleman, uh, and the quotes up there on, on the slide, um, in the UK HE sector, language students come from a more comfortable background uh, than students of any other university dis discipline except medicine. Um, and as wealth um, and the willing disregard for the per pervasive evils of the colonial heritage tend to go hand in hand, um, it's perhaps unsurprising that in our experience there has been a distinct lack of students demanding a decolonized curriculum for modern languages uh, in particular. So uh, combine these factors um, help us understand um, that to decolonize modern languages curricula and by which we mean to expose um, its intimate relationship with the fetish of modernity, coloniality and capitalism, it, it, it's first and foremost a project of deconstruction of the self um, for those who have been educated in modern languages in the past. If what we've learned as, as modern languages students is so uh, committed to problematic principles, how well are we equipped to offer uh, alternative ways of thinking about the world and alternative forms of political practice uh, praxis in our curricula? And uh, how are our students, uh, how open are our students to learn ways of conceiving the world um, that are crafted by cultures perceived by mainstream curricula as subaltern to, to their own? Um, so uh, we believe that uh, change may come the day that uh, teachers and students reflect on their own privilege and positionality as a starting point and um, that's certainly been um, a theme for thinking about decolonization in the encounters that I've had. Um, you know the day that we refuse to repeat and reinforce restrictive uh, forms and knowledge methods and pedagogical ways of doing things. Um, in order to engage with uh, decolonial practice in all of our teaching, we need to begin by deconstructing our own ideas about what it means to speak a language and to possess knowledge in the modern world. Uh, and we argue that the shifts towards uh, a more uh, meaningful and therefore radical decolonial practice in the teaching of languages and cultures is something that we can build upon um, that's actually unique to our discipline. In terms of moving towards a tentative solution to the problems that we, we see in the history and in the teaching of modern languages, um, we want to reiterate Alison Phipps uh, when she talks about a decolonizing practice in terms of placing oneself in the more vulnerable place of not knowing. We're suspicious of the metaphorization of the term decolonization, which removes the process from the actual work of what Tuck and Yang describe as um, repatriating indigenous land and life. And we understand decolonization as, as we were saying this morning, as an ongoing process or set of practices, not something that can simply be uh, completed or finished. In practical terms, um, what we want to suggest is a uh, cross languages um, staff uh, working group um, in all modern languages departments to discuss this idea of uh, deconstruct to decolonize. And this would be a means of moving towards a decolonial practice in um, departments across the UK and perhaps uh, beyond. The core idea here is to move firmly away from decolonization as this buzzword for diversifying the curriculum and to unpack how the term has often been co-opted uh, for what Tuck and Yang call uh, a series of moves to innocence which in the US context in, in, in which they're writing, work to, uh, quote, reconcile settler guilt and complicity and rescue settler futurity. We believe it's vital, uh, we believe it's vital for there to be a space in which we together, uh, in which, sorry, staff, um, can find their own 
way to begin the hard unsettling work of decolonization that brings about uh, a recognition that it is in fact perfectly possible to do harm to others just by being oneself. And I'm quoting uh, Tuck and Yang there. This means we're less interested in proposing new uh, modules to address the problem of coloniality in our curriculum. Rather, we propose that it's essential to have staff question their very understanding of modern languages to consider in what ways their existing disciplinary offers perpetuate colonial power structures. And the three initial points for discussion in our proposed working group include uh, deconstructing key concepts that are central to our understanding of what we do in the modern university and in modern languages in particular. So in the second part of this paper, um, we just briefly want to comment on each of these concepts in turn. Um, and we're obviously very open to suggestions and welcome uh, suggestions on how to structure uh, 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 what, what kind of terms we might want to de uh, deconstruct as part of this working group, but also ways in which we might structure this engagement with our colleagues. We're obviously very aware that this isn't necessarily going to be an easy sell to many of our peers, um, but we're confident that now is as, as good a time as any for attempting this. So the first term we want to deconstruct is modernity. So the modern in modern languages does uh, more than to mark the time of emergence of the languages we teach. It naturalises modernity by defining it as the starting point for language as a whole, and um, not just uh, to the European languages that we, that we teach. And this is particularly so in cases where we market our languages as global languages. Um, and it, often we do this because we say that, that, that there's an impressive number of speakers of, of these global languages, but actually um, there's only an impressive number of those speakers because uh, these languages were once colonial languages. So we agree with Mignolo uh, when he speaks of modernity and coloniality being part of the same process of exclusion and exploitation. We also agree with uh, Maria Lugones, who in her writings on sexuality sees colonial and modern as one and the same thing. By making modernity central to what we do in our discipline, we make it into both a point of departure and a point of arrival by reifying its centrality, um, which necessarily reproduces the very um, epistemicide that it's based upon. And some key, key questions we want to ask here are, why is it that we trace the emergence of coloniality to the appearance of a modern global capitalism and largely ignore what comes before? And what can be productively gained from a discussion with our medieval studies uh, colleagues? And how might we productively reframe the study of constructs such as modernity and knowledge across time um, as well as geographies? Uh, when were these terminologies and concepts coined? Um, and how complicit are they to the hegemony of, of modernity? Our second term is, is knowledge. Um, as uh, Linda uh, to UI Smith and others demonstrate, um, knowledge is not a free floating innocent thing to be discovered by us and our students. It has been at the core of the colonizing process and as one of the raw materials of imperialism. Um, knowledge that's been discovered or perhaps taken from indigenous communities was not only commodified within existing Western knowledge systems, that same knowledge was then also put uh, to use to colonize indigenous communities. As uh, Smith uh, puts it, uh, imperialism and colonialism are the specific formations through which the West came to uh, see, to name and to know indigenous communities. Thus, in order to move towards the practice of decolonizing knowledge, um, we must first acknowledge that there is a contradiction at the very heart of the idea of a decolonized knowledge. Here we want to restate our understanding of decolonization as an ongoing process, um, but at the same time acknowledge that we do need to create practical suggestions uh, for new modes of teaching that move us beyond a place where we are perpetuating colonizing structures. So some more questions I think we need to work through with our colleagues um, and students. If research has been deeply embedded in the ideology and practice of imperialism, then how are the source materials we use in class implicated in colonial exploitation? Are discoveries ever innocently made? 
Um, how do we get away from our own ways of seeing, writing, citing, and referring to the world in or via scholarly articles, chapters, and books? If a decolonial practice means establishing alternative methods for citing and referring to knowledge encounters, um, to what extent can this be done in the classroom together with students? So how can the use of um, these alternative methods be assessed? Um, should we be asking the more radical question of whether there's a role for traditional assessment at all? Um, the one thing to consider here is how um, we can use the classroom to genuinely prepare students for life outside of um, the privatised space of the university. Is it possible to have students, um, for example, design uh, a knowledge commons uh, that would then be made available outside the university? Is there a work students themselves can do in studying the ways the university itself is implicated in uh, colonialism and slavery, with students then assessed on the knowledge commons that they create about that complicity. We're also very much aware that um, in a results-driven environment, students will only see as knowledge that which is branded as such by their markers, by, by the university tutors. But this means that um, we do actually have some real power here to change students' views on what constitutes knowledge. And we'd also hope that such moves by staff um, would lead students themselves to start demanding these other modes of assessment that give students a whole new critical lexicon and, and range of skills that can be, can be applied in the, in the kind of quote-unquote uh, real world. The third term that we want to uh, suggest uh, needs uh, deconstructing is, is language. Um, even before, and this is um, getting at, at some of the questions that Ruth was raising there at the end of her, her, her talk, um, even before we ask a question about learning non-European, non-modern languages, uh, indigenous languages, our experience of language teaching and learning is of a classroom that actually really totally neglects plurality, uh, variation and diversity in the European languages that we already teach. Um, we maintain ideas of right and wrong that are detached from the everyday pragmatics of communication. Um, and all of this uh, begins with the question uh, we ask our, uh, ourselves and our students, and that is of what language uh, we speak, i.e. what singular language do we speak? And this needs to think more about um, how we um, perceive the word uh, language um, is central to uh, decolonizing uh, uh, the curriculum, we think. And, and, and you know, um, we think we need to begin embarking on a new process of learning and teaching um, indigenous languages and cultures, but also uh, uh, language variation in universities. And in some ways that has to come, has to come first. Um, it's clear to us then that for too long we've resided in our language disciplines uh, when it comes to the kind of knowledge we encounter and the extent to which the uh, non-metropolitan fields of Francophone or Hispanic or Lusophone studies um, can be seen to have corrected the way that language disciplines perpetuate colonial ways of knowing I think is also questionable because um, methodologies have not always been adapted for knowledge systems existing beyond the colonial West. But also these sub-disciplines of uh, Hispanic, Francophone, Lusophone um, have sought to insulate themselves from the shortcomings of the European language disciplines, um, but nevertheless adopt a monolingual lens to collect forms of knowledge that might challenge metropolitan understandings of the world. If we agree with um, Adele Vrana and others that uh, language is a proxy uh, for knowledge, um, then our language areas have limited our ability to see beyond the narrow confines of the European languages and discourses in which we're schooled. And in our view, we can't tackle narrow conceptions of discourse and, uh, and knowledge um, without opening ourselves up to other languages, and language variants um, that have been marginalized by our discipline. In our view, we must develop new ways of incorporating language variation in the classroom uh, and thereby raise interest in our students who are much younger, more curious and have the time um, to go away and study other languages outside of the mainstream. And indeed, the university 
uh, must increase provision of teaching in uh, those non-European languages. So uh, just to conclude, um, we believe that it is um, only by making uh, changes to the way we encounter our topics as teaching staff, indeed by formulating this self-reflexive space for staff, um, that we can begin to engage in the process of decolonizing our existing practices. And this, in our view, is um, a vital process we must all go through before conceiving any discrete new module um, that might claim to decolonize the curriculum. And we do recognize that this will be a difficult process to embark on, uh, perhaps even more difficult to persuade existing colleagues of the importance of engaging with their previous research and teaching in this way. However, we would like to suggest that this kind of work can and should intersect with the strategic recovery of modern languages as a discipline. And one of the reasons uh, we think students do not choose to study languages at university is that they, and perhaps we, um, don't realise the power of language to make the world uh, we live in, and thereby, of course, the vital role of languages uh, that languages play in reinforcing uh, the oppressive and unequal relations of power between human beings. And part of our role as, as ad advocates and activists for language learning has to be an ability to deconstruct, to unsettle and to unlearn our previous ways of doing things. So here um, we think we must recognise the damage we, we've done and the damage we're doing. Um, but we must also uh, acknowledge that languages will be a place, and this is quoting Alison Phipps again, um, languages uh, will be the place where we are going to relive uh, violence and struggle with its ongoing effects as we try to use uh, languages in recovery. But we should know that this difficult work of recovery will ultimately benefit us all. So we want to suggest a practical solution for taking further small steps uh, to rethink our offer in languages and for reflecting on the different meanings of our departure points. But we also want to think carefully about what the meaning uh, about the meaning of what we conceive of as a recovery in relation to languages learning and teaching in universities. In our view, uh, some kind of program that we might want to call uh, deconstruct to decolonize um, can be part of a solution that does not fall back on uh, commodifying language learning as useful for a career uh, in international business. You know, of course, echoing those reasons for the establishment of the field in the first place. You know, for us, commodification means focusing almost exclusively on measurable and monolingual language skills a pathway that ignores the inherently interdisciplinary and uh, diverse uh, nature of the study of languages at university. And for us, commodification cannot be part of the solution. Instead, we want to raise the stakes of our discipline, uh, solidifying its position as one that offers a self-reflexive linguistic and epistemolog epistemological practice necessary for remaking a kinder, uh, more compassionate an equal world in which decolonization is not just a buzzword or metaphor, um, but part of a meaningful deconstructive practice we apply um, first and foremost uh, to ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, and we move on. We are going to go now uh, to listen to the paper by Melissa Drivarin. Uh, Melisandre is uh, an independent, they are an independent artist who use their identities as black non-binary co-parent to find, make and collect new routes to and new forms of knowledge and creation sharing. Uh, Melisandre recently left the University of Warwick in Luxembourg to come uh, to continue their research, making and caring uh, away from the institution. Before undertaking their PhD studies, they studied at the UCL in Environment and Sustainable Development. Uh, Melisandre's paper's title today is Where Words Fail, Looking for a Language at the, margin, uh, at the Margins of Western Universities. Melisandre, thank you so much for joining us. And if you'd like, you will begin. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to speak with one phone and I'm, you, you will see me through another screen, so I'm not sure how it's going to work. 
So maybe it will be my name in big for a little while, and then uh, I'll share with you a video. So, um, decolonizing modern languages is also a matter of decentering knowledge from verbal to embodied knowledge. My hypothesis is that where academic words fail, artistic interpretation of feelings could crack through the thick skin of colonial and thus reductionist forms and content of knowledge. In the 2020 abstract of throwing our bodies against the white background of academia, Aziza Johnson writes, this paper addresses the difficulty of conducting research about non-white racialized persons while working within predominantly, predominantly white academic institutions. A sentence that I would like to queer use as, a as I practice deviation from academic language to the fractal languages I ought to use to survive. Fractal is used here as opposed to so-called fragmented as I weave my argument and claim the right for unbelonging in white universities. This gesture also echoed chapter five, how to tame a wild tongue in border, Borderlands La Frontera, the new Mestiza, by Gloria Anzaldua. The author quotes Ray Gwyn Smith. Who is, it, who is to say that robbing a people of its language is less violent than war? I observe and feel the impossibility for black and post-colonial beings to find and make a lieu out of white academic institutions. I, I use lieu in Martinican thinker Patrick Chamoiseau's terms, which is a place for us marginalized over to finally bloom. Monolithic academic language imposition is violent and contributes in what I frame as the still ongoing war against black bodies reproducing itself within academic spaces too. Inspire, inspired by the potential of exploring counter-hegemonic ways to hold conversations after Gayatrisha Krovarti Spivak, I would like to limit the input of words that are, that are, in fact, complex colored feelings translated to and for an academic audience. Instead, I would like to invite you to feel through my experiences as a self-identified black non-binary co-parent of a one-year-old being at the time of the video that I'm going to share with you. Looking, I was looking for ways to navigate white university as a PhD student at both the University of Warwick in Theater and Performance Studies and the University of Luxembourg in Sciences du Langage. This audiovisual assemblage is made of a series of uncut images. I made, I made it as a guerrilla film made with what I had, so a home camera and very limited time as I withdrew my energies from what I, I and other black beings experienced as an hostile environment. And for more on this point, I invite you to look at my, the work of Mac out of Out of order, please do not use, is the title of the audiovisual material I made as a by note to the institution where, where I, where, sorry, where I have experienced gendered racism in multiple forms. I, I would now like to share with you and end this verbal uh, translation with an extract of the description of the audiovisual uh, assemblage. Um, so I quote myself, institutional gendered racism is not something that should be dealt with in closed doors, closed rooms by white people for white people to secure their positions of power. The university as an institution needs to pay black beings for their labor, need to reevaluate values assigned to pluriversal forms of knowledge and knowledge content. The university needs to be kind, politically kind, to care and to stop performing white survival. As of today, 22nd of June 2020 at 11.48, I withdraw my energies from this violent space that made me suffocate. 
I will now share my screen. Um, and then maybe um, while you're watching the video or after when we have the q and I will drop you a link, the link of a collective open letter I've contributed in to address whiteness in its specific forms within theater, dance and performance studies in the UK. And uh, I would like to thank you now for inhabiting the internet space with me for a little while, while I'm looking for a way to share my screen with you.
the emergency red flag to open the door. In case it's emergency, red flag to open the door. Emergency door. Emergency door. In case of emergency, cover red glass to open the door. And not emergency red glass to open the door. I couldn't see myself. It's very easy.
That's it. That's it. That's it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Melisandra. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. So we have now 20, a little less uh, than 20 minutes for discussions. Um, if you would like, so uh, just like Joe did in the first session, of course, everyone is uh, more than welcome to use the chat group. Uh, we will not be reading from the chat group, so we understand that everyone can be reading that. And uh, we would like, you know, if anyone has a question so they can raise their hand and uh, electronically raise their hand using the raising your hand um, tool uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, and, and uh, you know, share questions, thoughts, ideas, uh, anyone that uh, can help us. Uh, continue our work um, and with which can dialogue. Also, with with uh, in case in terms of Ruth's paper, uh, she's not here, but she would really she was really looking forward to seeing how people took uh, her paper and for them to to express themselves. Because again, uh, her session was recorded, and she's really looking forward to hear what we have to say about what she has uh, brought forward. Okay, that's fine, Vincenzo, go on. You write down your question, I'll read it. I can just yes. ask oh, the so question. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. Sorry, it's fine. Vincenzo. No, no, <laughs> Please, <laughs> that's go okay, ahead. that's okay. Thanks. Um, I have, um, uh, first of all, congratulations for this very interesting presentations. Um, very, uh, very interesting also for me because they open in my my vision towards uh, unexplored uh, aspects of decolonizing languages. Um, I have a generic question to ask, which is a kind of a trouble that I have, I tend to have, and I want to discuss with people who are knowledgeable in, in this aspect, is the use of the word indigenous, which is a word that uh, I, find, uh, I, I find uncomfortable to use because of uh, its uh, historically negative connotation that it had over the centuries as a consequence of, of colonialism. So um, indigenous in its neutral form, is, it doesn't have any, any negative or positive connotation because it refers to all those beings. It could be people, it could be plants, it could be animals that grow that are grown in a specific geographical area but the way it's been used over the centuries always remarked this hierarchy between the uh, colonizer and the colonized the explorer and the visited culture so if we uh, my question is that there are synonyms obviously but uh, uh, and i know it, maybe it's a uh, might sound as a silly question but as we uh, we want to decolonize languages my question is um shouldn't we start from scratch and tend to use more neutral words in order to decolonize and to eradicate these implicit hierarchical structures within the language itself that's the question anyone would like to comment to build up onto it i'm happy to uh, thanks, Vincenzo. Thanks for your question. I share your concern with uh, with some of the terms. I'm aware I did use the term indigenous in my talk. Um, I suppose I the way I feel about this. My question. I don't mean to be awkward, but I suppose I would ask a question back at you, which is: to what extent? To what extent is there any neutral language here? To what extent is there any kind of um, place that we can begin, which is a which we could call neutral? And I think um, in that regard, I would probably rather suggest that we use language in in a sensitive way, but that we we flag when we're using these uh, problematic terminologies, etc. Because I I find it. You know, obviously, it's it's very difficult. We cannot. Um, well, I think we need to begin at the beginning, but I think that that there, there, there's different levels and there are different kind of steps we can take. And for us, I think we would say that we were taking. My Molly might have something to add. We were certainly taking 
small steps um, to move towards a position where we can um, we can begin decolonizing or engage in a process of decolonizing. Thank you. Anyone else would like to either add to this point or bring in anything else? Yes, uh, I see Caroline has raised her hand. Please, Caroline. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, in terms of neutral language, I was actually thinking that perhaps the camp franglais and this idea of contact languages that Ruth was discussing um, could be something to incorporate more um, in, in how we teach language because we're always teaching, for instance, I'm, I teach French and it's always the proper French, um, but actually that's not how people speak. So I always include a lot of slang, a lot of, of different words from different countries that we have incorporated um, in the sense that it's not a neutral language, but it is a language um, that represents this kind of, of evolution and mixity. Um, I had, so that's just a, a thought, but I had a question in terms of, of trying to reduce the gap between language teaching and literature teaching. Um, and I was wondering, how do we do this? Um, and, and especially it seems arbitrary because as a language teacher, we use a lot of film, a lot of, of text. Um, and in the same way, when you're teaching literature, you always have to cover in some way grammar. Uh, if a student has the question. So how do we concretely try to reduce this gap? Uh, if I may, Caroline, um, yeah. Um, at Birmingham, we're trying to do that. Uh, and this is not to say we have an answer. We're just basically bashing our heads against the wall for three years, trying to get somewhere with it. Uh, we have completely changed the curriculums at Modern Languages in Birmingham since 2017, in which we try to do competent language integrated learning. So mm. we basically have this material for the week, and we try that this material that uh, someone is going to be lecturing about, that students will be discussing in seminars, we try to make the language uh, teaching also about this material, uh, mm. however, uh, um, tangentially. This is very difficult because, of course, there are no books, there are, uh, 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 there are no grammar books, there are no uh, guides and pronunciation that will cover any sort of material, which means that people at the, this, this department have been working very, very hard to produce tailored main materials for every single week, for every single contact hour language, and people are very, very tired of, of, of that work. Uh, but it, it, it does pay off in a way or another. I think, um, okay, this is one of the things that we're trying to do and it does work in terms of content. Okay, so uh, uh, the kind of conversations that we have, we can take from, from the materials and at Birmingham we go into this whole idea of uh, word, um, music and image. So we are trying to get out of certain paradigms specifically while as unique paradigms. But one of the things that I don't think we're being very successful enough to do is basically to bring the actual language variety into the classroom. Um, and to bring language variety into the classroom is, is to get rid of words like proper, for example, because when you look and I work with, uh, I have two linguists at the Department of Modern Languages of Birmingham, just been hired in 2017. And there are words for that. You know, you're basically using a prestige variety of a language, prestige variety of which group, which is the register that you're using. And more often than not, uh, people do teaching language are just not uh, educated in this uh, uh, area of linguistics, for example, to relativize the very language that they teach. Uh, again, some people say, uh, and I've been in this discussion as well, but we have to teach them something. We have to be able to assess something. Of course, of course we do. Uh, we are assessing uh, pragmatical situations and the student who's the best in the language is the students who can actually go through uh, uh, the widest number of, of situations from a formal conversation to an informal conversation uh, for a common, normal con from a formal conversation uh, in whatever part of the country of uh, finding someone else who will be speaking that language as their second language even though they are from that country you see what I mean and those are questions that I am learning to, to address a bit with my colleagues in linguistics. Uh, uh, and, and they are really being crucial in actually 
breaking down this thing that we call language. But again, most modern languages curriculum don't do phonetics, don't do phonology. We basically tell, you speak like this. What, what is like this, right? Or uh, this is the proper speaker, this is the right way. Well, this is appropriate, inappropriate, depending on what. What is the variety we're talking about? Does that apply for the whole, you know, what is variety? Are we going to start discussing varieties? Uh, because I have encountered students who have been, and again, I do Portuguese, but I have one of these modules where everyone can take it. Someone who basically thought, oh, it said, a student, I came here to, to learn and to talk about proper French. Uh, so this thing that you're bringing up is not proper French, because the idea of French is the Parisian French of a certain uh, uh, social group. And again, it was a year two student uh, who took French as an advanced language. So someone who already spoke French, someone who's already been at one year at the university, and someone who wasn't aware of those, those things. And I think part of my paper with Joe talks about is precisely that, is for example, me sitting back on the learning chair and coming with my colleague in linguistics and help me here, because uh, what do I say to them? W what is the terminology that is the most constructive uh, for me to be able to to transmit something that I already tell them is relative, and it will relatively uh, be assessed. For example, again, assess, assessment problems uh, uh, being other set of things that I, I uh, and many other colleagues have been sitting through and say, okay, what do we do about this? So th this is a bit about the, this kind of, and, and I'm really, really sorry that one of my colleagues in linguistics that was going to present her paper can't do it because she's on annual leave which is precisely one of the issues that she's going to be talking about, Dr. Alice Gore. Uh, about the, the, the indigenous languages, I find it, yes, uh, new term, and I love the idea of terminology, and, and, and I really believe that sometimes we need new terms to deal with things anew, uh, uh, and, and I'm not at all close to that, and I, I don't have uh, specifically, I use, and, and Joe as well, in our paper, we use indigenous in the way that people talk about non-European uh, uh, language, which is really interesting because, well, are, what are we going to call Occitan, for example? Is it an indigenous language of France? Uh, what are we going to call, you see what I mean? Because it's, it's French, the modern language that got, gets stitched all over, but Occitan is what is named. Oh no, Occitan is not an indigenous language, but uh, Tupi is, uh, Guarani is. Uh, and, and, and again, these are the right questions for us to ask because we might, even though we might not have an answer to them, the fact that we ask them and we ask them together with our students, I think, is, is a fantastic step forward. Uh, uh, and again, we ask them together. Someone may have a tentative answer for those questions. Uh, and there is someone else with them. I think it was, was uh, Mirage. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, Mairead, yeah, that's right. Um, thanks very much for the talks. I, I, I very much enjoyed the presentations. I have a kind of a general question, which I, I guess, and, and a comment just to give a bit of context. Um, I'm interested in whether or not the project and this undertaking to engage with colleagues extends to second level or even primary level education, and if there's any collaboration happening. And I ask this because I'm myself involved in a collaborative project at the moment, which is developing a resource for teaching um, modern languages, um, I'll come back to the, the, the scare quotes, uh, I guess, uh, teaching modern languages in the primary school, just it's a pilot scheme that we're developing a resource for and we're teaching it through music to focus on soundscapes rather than on grammar and so on and so forth. Now it's very much still in the early stages, but my part in it is kind of theoretical, um, I guess. And what what I'm interested in is just to know whether whether or not you're involved with uh, people in other levels, because what I've noticed here in Ireland, of course, we have a very unique situation whereby, um, uh, so we have Gaelga, which is Irish, which is our indigenous, if you want to use that term, which again is problematic, of course, we would be inclined to use native, I guess, our native language rather than indigenous. Um, and that is the first language officially. Uh, and there is a there is a perception here that it is very much the subaltern language uh, among the general student body. Um, in, in schools, in primary and secondary. And so part of this new resource is to teach it alongside French. I'm, I'm a lecturer in French to see if we can um, change the perception 
and I think Joseph you talked about that very much and I think that for me that really is key that we need to change it maybe a little bit earlier um, than when they come into us in higher education um, and so for example um, in, in, in Ireland here now if you're teaching uh, for example I, I sat on the board on, on, a, on a review board for a new a new program which was introduced in, an, in the university in Dublin two years ago for teacher training program and the name of the course is modern languages and Gaelga. Now Gaelga is the word for Irish and so I argued for a change of the name and that it should be just modern languages because Irish being like a European language and one of the official languages of the European Union is a modern language is what I was arguing and so there was a, a big debate there among colleagues um, and it was decided to keep the, the distinction between modern languages and so this is really a very big debate over here and I'm just wondering whether or not it has extended in your own research to the kind of primary and secondary level. Thanks. Apologies, just a second. Yes, apologies. Uh, if uh, so, we do have a couple more hands uh, up. So we had Sarah, uh, whose hand was up, but Sarah, Sarah's still there. Uh, yes, I'm yes. Still there. Would yes. you like to make my comment now? It, yes, uh, and 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 then uh, if someone would like to get back to Mary, uh, Mary's position, please also raise your hand. Please, Sarah. Um, so, thank you to all the, the speakers today. Sorry, my camera's flashing on and off. Um, I just thought it, it, it made me think of um, our rationale for teaching languages. Their example of your undergraduate student in their second year who wants to learn standardised normative French. Um, and I think that's a rationale that many of our students are pursuing. I think we see it in the National Languages Strategy document that came out in July 2020 that the reason given to young people to pursue a language is very utilitarian, it's instrumentalized, they're encouraged to learn a language for business, they're encouraged to learn it for their career prospects. And that extends to all domains in education these days, that's a common narrative or rhetoric. So I wonder if we want to decolonize the curriculum, do we have to reassess the purposes of education and the reason why our young people are pursuing a particular discipline? Yeah. Uh, Mary, would you like to go back to that? Oh. Mary? I'm sorry, hello? Yeah, sorry. I, oh, I was just saying, okay. I think that um, that that's kind of what I what I think that the key the key issue is that we need to change the perceptions kind of globally and at an earlier stage that like when they come to university they come for a qualification that will get them a job and they already have their they have already formed a very um clear uh, perception of where the language can take them and what it can do for them and the cultural competence element of language learning is just being neglected from kind of primary school right through and then we're kind of throwing it in in the year abroad saying you know have a cultural experience but it's not there from the beginning I think. And uh, Gita Jali? Hi thanks so much for those presentations I was nodding furiously all throughout. Um, I was particularly interested um, by Joe and Emanuele your presentation about how um, we should look inwards as departments before we start thinking about critically engaging with the curriculum. And my question is about accountability. So how do we ensure that as decolonization is a process and a practice, how throughout we ensure accountability? Because um, one of the challenges I found, so um, I'm not uh, I'm not an academic or at university, but I work with secondary schools, and I find that you know, as you yourself pointed out, that um, what diversity implies or diversifying implies is an end goal that we can quantify and then and therefore be able to say whether we've done it or not, and that's the difference between diverse, di diversifying and decolonizing. So I wonder how through um, bringing together. Um, groups of academics and thinking through these ideas and looking at it as a pro process we can 
ensure accountability as well, that we are um, doing what we, we say that we're doing. I can respond to that, uh, Manuel, if that's okay. Um, thank you, yes. thank you for your question. Um, I'm glad to hear um, it was interesting. Um, I think actually um, we said, we mentioned in the paper, one, as one way of kind of ensuring accountability might be to enthuse our students to make us more accountable and to try to in, kind of encourage or um, make our students aware of the issues in such a way that they might then demand um, a, a process of decolonization. So that might be one way of ensuring accountability. I think at the institutional level, you know, there definitely, there have to be named people who, and, 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 and as we're suggesting kind of working groups or some kind of structure in order to engage in, in the process. Um, but ultimately, I think it's a difficult question because it's, it's also, it means um, having that kind of process recognized um, at, in, 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 the, in the hierarchy of the university, which is quite a kind of hard edifice to, to crack, I think. Um, I think more, you know, I think there are a lot of senior uh, university people in, in, interested in de decolonization, uh, especially, especially now, but I, I'm not convinced that they're interested in it for the right reasons or that they're interested in uh, a genuine uh, engagement with, with, with a process of decolonization as an ongoing process rather than something that can be done as in the case of say diversifying the curriculum as, as you said there. So I, yeah, I think that's, it's, it's a question I, I can't really answer apart from what we said in terms of uh, trying to get students into the position of demanding this. That seems to have worked quite well in uh, an institution like SOAS, where the whole decolonizing uh, the curriculum movement has been led by students. Um, and I think, as we said in our talk, it's a bit different with modern languages because we don't perceive such a kind of activist base in modern languages, at least in the UK, or at least in our experience of teaching in the UK. But I don't know if other people have other experiences of that. I'd be very interested to, to hear um, what other people's experiences are. Uh, yeah, next uh, in line for questions or, or points, we have Grit and then we have Sabrea. So Grit, would you like to join us? Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for organizing and putting together this amazing event. I've learned so much um, um, uh, today already. Um, I would like to go get back to May Reed and her question about secondary and primary education because I'm an um, English language teacher educator for primary and secondary teachers and I'm currently based in Austria and I've been on this job for the past 12 years and maybe that is a little surprising to you guys because I only came across this decolonizing discourse a couple of months ago. And here in Germany, and especially in Austria, and in English language teacher education, nobody talks about this. And for me, that's quite, yeah, I can see your faces. That's quite surprising. Um, so for me, this whole thing is pretty new. That's why I, I, I'm glad to join this um, conference. But what I do see is a definite need to, you know, get going and, and to, to engage with this. Um, what is happening though is that we diversify curricula and kind of look at texts that are read in classrooms from a diversity perspective. Now I'm pretty sure it's not the same as decolonizing it, but I think like for us maybe this is the first step. And in terms of primary education, there's huge potential in doing so also in terms of decolonizing the curriculum when we look at the various textbooks that are available from Anglophone and other cultures, either in translation or also bilingually. However, what we need to keep in mind is that we always have like a, like a state curriculum that is sitting in front of us. And the one for primary schools here in Austria is pretty devastating because one of the main educational aims of primary education is to teach children the facts of parenthood. And that was a quote. Okay, so the, and, and also like the curriculum kind of talks about relationship between men and women. So we are kind of in a very, let's say, traditional context. And it's so difficult to, to get beyond that because the also the new teachers 
that will be teachers at schools in the future, they're socialized in the system as well. And they're, they're very much geared towards hierarchical thinking as well. So when I try to come up with you know, provocative issues or I bring along pro provocative material, none of the students catches up because, and then I'm asking, you know, don't you see that this is racist, that, that this is sexist and that I'm trying to provoke comments here? They're like, no, you bring it along. You're the teacher, this should be correct. And I was like, no, that's not the case. And it, it's very much hard work to, to get them, you know, into this critical perspective and, and to kind of implement or ignite in them, you know, these critical thoughts as well. And it's really um, difficult. And what I also wanted to comment on was the textbook issue, but more for teaching English at school, like, like so course books, basically. Again, a lot of work necessary, a lot of work necessary. They are like the norm or they normalize the white male perspective throughout. We hardly have like, don't, don't ask what kind of disability or how people with disabilities are represented in textbooks because they're not. We hardly find people wearing glasses. So they're very much kind of normalizing able white male bodies in, in general. One example maybe where also this decolonizing perspective comes in is that when they, the textbook talks about poverty, the examples are from Jamaica. And if we have people looking for a job, it's African-Americans, right? So, so we have a very strong re-implementation of existing stereotypes and it's terrible. I mean, textbooks, they really try to, 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 to contribute to kind of, you know, this, this, this more multicultural perspective, but it takes forever for them to get um, accredited and, and used in schools. Schools need to pay for them. And if they don't have the money, they use old textbooks. It, it's a long process. And I'm so, I sometimes don't know where, where to actually, you know, start and get going other than introducing my own students to a new material and not having head and shoulders, knees and toes as the primary go-to song to, to use all the time. Right. So I'm, I'm very curious about what's happening throughout this conference. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. I'm not sure this contributed anything and or answered your question, um, Mary, but... Yeah. I think it absolutely contributes, Grace, because I think we're all here looking for each other as well. This is this one of the reasons why we wanted to make a conference out of this, and we're very oh, happy with the possibility of going online and having it done, is to actually us finding each other uh, uh, across borders, across, you know, across what we can go across in the context of a pandemic. And, and enable us to learn from each other and to work together uh, uh, for us to advance questions in the ways that we can. I realize that we're almost 10 minutes over time, but can we just go until four o'clock so we can go to Sabri's question? Uh, and, and I would like to pose at least one question to Melisandre before we go. So um, Sabri, would you like to join us? <laughs> Sabri? Can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay. Yes. 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 I just want to say um, thank you very much for organizing this and giving us the opportunity to share our experiences. I just want to um, echo what uh, Sarah and uh, your colleagues were saying earlier on that I've, um, I'm, I'm teaching second year students as well who are going to do their year abroad. And they, a lot of them will ask stand for standardized French. And I'll say, you know, if you go to France, uh, north or the south, you will have different accents, different kind of expressions. And they look at me, you know, very, very surprised. And uh, so it is really important that through language and culture that we, we bring that awareness of diversity uh, in whatever the target country is. And the other thing I w wanted to say that is I am very privileged because of being of Algerian background and seeing how the media kind of portray or produce stereotypes, I'm able to, to kind of give that awareness to my students. And when they're looking at a text from the media, they have to really analyze the text and the origin of the text. Who has written the text? Is it from the far right paper, uh, etc.? Because I've had a few years ago students looking at migration and looking at sources from the far right and portraying immigrants 
in a very, very negative way. So it's it's really important in our profession that we 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 deal with these kind of stereotypes and we teach our students to be critical about their sources. So that's was what I wanted really to say. But I think there's there's room for discussion, sharing our practices in language and culture. We are able to 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 help our students navigate through this so it would be nice to to share our ex experiences what kind of sources we use how do we do it it would be really great to have another session where we can uh, use our um, resources and maybe share rather than all doing it separately that's all i wanted to say and thank you again very much Thank you, Sabria, and, and that's absolutely important. Uh, I think, uh, you know, many things are coming out of this in the sense that I think we have to continue, we have to find ways to stick together, and we have to find ways and platforms that allow us to keep this exchange. And because for many of us, many of you are alone sometimes doing what you're doing uh, and, and finding this strength with other people who are doing it, the same thing to you, something very similar to you, someplace else, is sometimes what you need to keep on going. Um, Sharing. Exactly, Sorry, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to ask Melisandre a question. Melisandre, thanks so much for your uh, intervention. I I would like, I mean, I did my PhD at Warwick, so when you were, uh, uh, when, when part of your uh, videos were there, I could recognize the buildings, I could recognize the doors, I could recognize quite a lot of it. Uh, my question to you is that you, you were really, you, you're proposing a, a, a different language, not a different language, you, you're proposing a language that exists, but it's also a, as a pedagogical language, uh, as a language that exists as, so how, uh, um, how do you see the potential of the body uh, 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 and this, this, this very um, embodiment? How, how do you see, uh, Melisandre, uh, ways in which to bring the embodiment of uh, uh, this embodied perspective into that which we do, because it's interesting. Language is not only something we do, uh, we do essentially with the body. The body is language. That relationship with the body is, is fabulous. We have uh, nonverbal language. We have, you know, so much of us speak. Uh, uh, and, and so I, I, if you could just, you know, just share with us, Megasandri, how you see the, the, the language and corporeality uh, and embodiment and, and the many ways in which embodiment can help us to de-automatize uh, uh, a perspective on, on, on society that is pretty, pretty much uh, perpetrated by coloniality with specific ways of embody, to bring the body, to add onto the body, uh, uh, to, to let the body exist. If you could just, you know, elaborate, that would be fantastic. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I think that um, methodologically there are lots of uh, work to be done within modern languages to make it more um, inclusive. Uh, I've, uh, during my PhD I was doing for example a performance as research which is a practice as research so basically relying on words uh, for half of a, of a PhD work, so to write my thesis, and then to relying on artistic um, uh, interventions or provocations that I would be making. So um, I didn't say at the beginning of my presentation that my work is uh, relying both on performance arts, but also on autoethnography. So that's the, the, the link with um, uh, modern language. Um, and I think that uh, to me, from a, a personal uh, perspective to white institutions, uh, the limitation of having to articulate words, uh, and I'm talking about academic framing of uh, of paper uh, in this uh, <laughs> uh, in this example, um, is extremely limiting. Like there are lots of people that will maybe want to engage in this in the conversation, but they are just not here at the moment because. Um, I mean, it's ex extremely exclusive to be able to come to a panel and discuss, uh, you know, uh, in closed room about m modern languages uh, in particular. And um, what? I, I, sorry, I, I lost the, the, the thread of my thought. But um, for example, from uh, uh, where I'm coming from, so I'm I'm originated from. Uh, Congo, Benin, and Guadeloupe we rely a lot on nonverbal uh, transmission of knowledge, and this is uh, something that if I wanted it to be integrated in my PhD, I needed to write about it. 
uh, from this uh, modern language uh, perspective. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be uh, validated. Uh, so I think that um, including things like uh, something that I managed to do uh, later in my research or so practice as research in modern languages as well will be a key also to integrate um, uh, pluriversal ways, uh, more diverse ways of thinking, like uh, of creating thinking and sharing knowledge. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Melissandra. I think it's 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 paramount what you bring because it's, it's exactly that is when the very form of knowledge that you bring is not considered form of knowledge and it can only be assessed, evaluated or validated if it transforms into something else and therefore loses what, what it is to begin, become with, uh, to begin with. And, 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 and this is epistemic of the violence written in, in so many levels. So when, when Joe and I were talking about language, this is one of the things that we're discussing as well. What is that that we consider language? What and again, a very important discussion that we have to do on methodologies, uh, on on the essay, on the assessment, on that which, to the extent in which we have powers. And I understand that our powers mainly, if you are a, a lecturer beginning your career, if you are a, a, a teaching fellow, if you are a person in term time contract only, all we can do is very limited, uh, in a myriad of forms. But within those limitations. Uh, the more we learn of what we can do, the more we can start doing things uh, and, and hopefully try to continue the change. Um, so I, I have to, to close for today uh, because it's four o'clock and, you know, it's 57 of you there. Many of you had, had to go already. Thank you so very much for joining us. It's been absolutely exciting it's it's been so energizing thank you so much for bringing here for contributing for bringing your ideas with a paper with an intervention let's continue staying in touch uh and we meet again through the same link that has been sent to you uh it's the same link throughout the days and we meet again tomorrow at 11 in the morning london time and again, uh, share this link with whomever you want, you know, just bring them in. Let's have these conversations and, and let's see what we can do. OK, thank you so very much to all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone. See you, you came along. See you tomorrow.